because, of course, protein structure should be determined by their amino acid sequences. This has been known for many, many years now. And uh, it's very likely that protein stru structures and complexes and uh, uh, RNA, the so called RNA molecules as well, correspond in general to global free energy minimum. And when they aren't actually the global energy minimum, they're probably among the very lowest line uh, possible states. And of course, why would we want to try and compute structural biology? Well, um, if we could do it, it would be very useful, obviously. Um, and it's also a real test of our understanding of what goes on in molecular biology. So I'm going to begin by talking about the uh, uh, sort of classic ab initio structure prediction problem, where you start with an extended chain, and um, the problem is to predict the three-dimensional structure of the protein. Now, uh, the problem, of course, is that uh, even a relatively small, short chain has a lot of, has very large number of possible configurations. So the outstanding problem is how to sample through this case space of possible configurations. And um, one has to, at the beginning, initially, sample as broadly as possible. And that means uh, you, the calculations have to be doable very quickly. Um, so to, at this level, we use a simplified representation of the chain, where um, the side chains are, are, uh, are represented just by single points. And the primary driving forces are the are burial, the hydrophobic um, residues in the core, and pairing of the beta strands. Now, the problem is that at this level, we, while we can sample very quickly, the, 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 the amount of time it takes to hold up a protein chain at, um, uh, at this level of representation is about what you saw on the, um, there, it was about the length of time that took the movie to play. Uh, we can't calculate energies very accurately because we've simplified the model too much. So we, uh, in practice, will carry out many thousands or tens of thousands of independent um, holding runs like this. And each one will end up in a different, slightly different structure, or often very different structure. And the challenge is to pick out which one of those is actually the lowest energy structure the protein really, in fact, holds to. So we need to put in all the atomic detail to start answering that question about which is the lower energy, which is the lowest energy structure. So the type of detail is exactly what you'd expect. Um, you look at protein structures, you see that the atoms are very close packed, you don't have holes. Packing is very important. We describe that with simple Van der Waals potential. Um, hydrogen dot bonding is very important. If you look at macromolecular structures, all the buried polar groups are um, generally making hydrogen bonds. And these hydrogen bonds uh, have an angular dependence, which uh, we model. Um, of course, desolvation, we have polar atoms on the outside, nonpolar atoms on the inside, and uh, so forth. Now, when we put all that detail in, the calculation becomes much slower. And you can see that now the backbone is really <coughs> moving only very little. Uh, what's happening here is we're starting from the end point of the previous calculation, and we're simply searching for the lowest energy structure in the, in the neighborhood. One where the side chains are packed, the hydrogen-buried hydrogen-bonding groups are making hydrogen bonds, and so forth. So the results, and this is a point I'm going to emphasize in this first part of my talk, pretty much look the same no matter what problem we are studying. On this axis is the energy. On this axis is uh, the um, a measure of structural similarity. In this case, since this is a protein where we know the structure is similarity to the native structure. Um, and these different black points are, are points that are sampled on uh, different, um, we, start with, we start with the first uh, calculation where things are rapidly moving around. We take the end point of that. We go into the second calculation where everything's just moving a little bit. And um, we, uh, uh, we take the, um, the lowest energy structure that's sampled on that second one. And so each dot comes from a separate uh, pair of trajectories. So you can see that different trajectories end up with very different energies and with very different structures here. So for example, one of them was unlucky. It ended up here uh, quite high in energy. Another one ended up down here relatively low in energy. But there's another one that's almost as low in energy, which is far out here. Uh, so this simply says that this landscape that's being searched is filled, is filled with hills and valleys. And where you end up is, is sort of random at, at this point. It just depends on which direction you happen to start off that first movie. And that's the only thing that's different. There's a different random number that starts the 
first random population. Okay. The second thing that you see is that if you start at the native structure, generally you're quite a bit lower in energy than all of these structures that you sample starting from the extended chain. So the native structure is in this quite deep minimum. And uh, the third thing you see is that if you can get close enough to the native structure, the energy drops, starts dropping quite a bit. But you have to get quite close. And the reason you have to get quite close is um, illustrated here. This is now a com comparison of the native structure. This is for the protein that was shown on the previous slide. Um, and in one color is the native structure, and the other color is the, that low energy structure that had the arrow next to it. And you see that in the core of the protein, the side chains are pretty close to where they are in the native structure. Um, and it's like you've done a jigsaw puzzle, and you've gotten it roughly right. All the jigsaw puzzle pieces are fitting together in roughly the right way. And this is what makes the energy drop, because it's very hard to for a random protein configuration for the side chains to all pack so perfectly. Now, uh, we've extended this over the years to um, many other types of problems. So this is a problem where instead of having a monomeric protein, we have a homodimer, and this would work as well for any type of homo oligomer. And here, what you saw there playing, and I guess I should do it again, uh, is the same type, this is exactly like the first movie I showed, except you have two chains that are holding up at the same time, and, so, and it's done symmetrically. So every time we make a move in this chain, we make a move in the other chain too. But we're also searching for the rigid body orientation at the same time. Um, and so, again, when the system isn't too, too big, uh, the lowest energy structures, we would then go and start going to the high resolution movie to the, find, putting all the details. And when the system isn't too big, the, um, the lowest energy structures we get can look quite a bit like the, are quite close to the native structure. This also holds for um, RNA. This is now the low resolution part of the uh, of the search for RNA, where again we really simplify things a lot so that it's quick. Um, and these are the same type of plots for RNA molecules. Again, energy versus RMSD. Again, you see that the data structure is uh, in general lower in energy than the structures that we sample starting from the extended chain, and that the lowest energy structures um, uh, can often be pretty close to the native structure. So here we have comparison. Now you notice these are really small RNA molecules, and um, that's in general that's a sort of a general characteristic of systems where we're actually able to find without any experimental information the lowest energy structure. If I were if I were, if I were going to show you a calculation now on a larger RNA molecule, uh, we, you would see all these blue points, and they'd be way out here. We simply wouldn't have anything as low energy as the native or um, anywhere close in, in uh, structure. Okay, so this general. So I'm summarizing on this slide what the general features we see of all these problems. We see a free energy gap between the native structure and the structures that we generate starting from the extended chain, and uh, uh, this gap is um, uh, these these structures we generate from the extended chain are non-native structures, of, action, of course. So whether we're looking at soluble proteins, multimeric proteins, heterodimers, RNAs, membrane proteins, um, the picture always looks the same. Um, and why is this? It's not because we're able to compute energies at some super high accuracy. It's really because in order for proteins, and the really amazing thing about molecular biology is that you have folded structures at all, that an RNA molecule folds up or a protein molecule folds up, is of course if these weren't biological entities, or if you had a polymer of, you know, hundreds or 200 subunits like a 200 residue protein, you'd expect it to be some random ensemble of states. And the really striking thing about uh, molecular biology, of course, is that you have that biomolecules fold up into very precise structures. And it's only possible if the free energies of those structures are very much lower than the structures of alternative possible states. Uh, so we're able to predict structure because the magnitude of these actual gaps, which have to exist, or proteins and RNAs to be stable are larger uh, than the errors um, in calculating, in our current area, errors in calculating the energies. So what this means then is that the real challenge is how do we sample close enough to the native structure uh, to, um, to get into this uh, sort of narrow basin where every, all the perfect packing occurs and the energy really drops. So we really have a search problem. And this is 
much of what we've been working on over the years. Um, there are, um, well, and certainly try to be smarter about the search. So you could imagine, for example, sending out exposure time to find the lowest elevation point on some new planet you've discovered. You could imagine sending out many, many explorers and having them each parachute down to some random point on the planet's surface and then report back to you what the lowest elevation point they found is. And then you could send out new explorers to search uh, those errors, those areas where the, the best, um, the lowest elevation points have been found in the first search. So these are the things that we've been playing around with. But the second uh, approach is, well, you can simply recruit more explorers. And so a number of years ago, we started a distributed computing project where uh, we uh, were trying to create the structure of a protein. We send the sequence out not to our own little cluster, but we send out anyone in the world who's participating. And they basically run that first, they run the two movies that you saw, uh, the low resolution the thing where everything's just jumping around in the, in the refinement. And then they send back to us the lowest energy structure. Um, and so we have a lot more sampling. It's like having, you know, 100 times more explorers in the lens, like in the landscape of exploration analogy. Um, we can also uh, uh, start closer. We don't have to start with an extended chain if we have more information. So often, it's, it's a, it's a um, often your sequence, the sequence that you might be interested in, is related to the sequence of a protein known structure, and it's an empirical observation that sequences that are similar almost always hold similar structures. So we can start with the structure of the home log, and that's the comparative model problem. Um, finally, uh, and I should say that's cheating, because we're not starting from the extended chain. But really, the best way to achieve is uh, to use experimental data. Of course, that's like telling in the explorer analogy, that's like saying, well, if you want to find the lowest elevation point on Earth, don't bother looking in North America, look in the Middle East. And that's a big clue. Um, and every bit of experimental data you have is a huge asset <coughs> for finding the, um, the correct structure. And um, uh, so that I'll spend some time today talking about this. And finally, um, uh, We've been doing a, we've been distrib doing distributed computing for some time, and the the as I said, people would watch the calculation on their computers as a screensaver, and they started writing in and saying, complaining that the computer was really dumb and it was moving the helix left when it should clearly go right, and uh, so so to try and take advantage of uh, try and let people um, die in the course of this short, short search, we developed um, uh, a game called Colbit, which um, were the, and the results have really been quite deep from that, and that's what I'll talk about. Here. Okay, so first, just to illustrate what happens with um, Rosetta at home. So here, this is a, a slightly bigger protein that you put in. This is Ty, and if we just do it in house, we get these red points here. This is again energy versus RMSD. Um, if we send it out to um, uh, Rosetta, we send it out now to all the participants of participants of Rosetta at home. We get sometimes these rather unsettling uh, plots. This is again energy versus RMSD. And you see there's one lucky person who won the lottery. This point is lower in energy than everybody else, and probably because it's lower in energy, it's also pretty close to the native structure. This is this guy's structure. And so we acknowledge these people on our website, and um, they, they and we acknowledge them in our papers, too, because actually this is a pretty important contribution. But you can see this is really not where you'd like to be, because there's only, if we didn't have this point, then probably this, this might be the lowest energy structure. And this is not really good enough for, um, uh, for confident structure prediction. So this is why when people come to me and say, I have a turn of residue protein, I don't know what the structure is, can, can you predict it for me? I say, well, we can try, but I won't believe it. Because you see, this is the problem. I mean, if, if you don't, if um, you would just as well get over here. So this is why I have an initial structure prediction. It's not really, it's not really something that's a great practical utility um, currently. All right, so what about, what about um, comparative modeling? So this is from the CAP structure prediction experiment, which is a blind testing of structure prediction methods. So in this case, we started with a sequence which folded up, started with a sequence that was homologous to um, a structure. From that, we built a model, model shown in red here. And then we basically started many, many um, uh, trajectories focusing more on the high resolution refinement, like that second movie where things weren't moving as much. And the lowest energy structure we got out is the green one shown here. And in blue is the, um, is the actual native structure. And uh, you can see that the green structure, is, is, during the calculation, things have moved from red to green. That's really quite a bit closer. Um, and if you look in the core, again, the side chains are coming together in a very similar way in the prediction, which is in green, and the uh, native structure, which is in blue. Uh, 
We can, this, this also goes for membrane proteins. This is from a, a, a challenge to predict the structure of the adenosine receptor. Here we started with the beta 2 adrenergic receptor, which is shown in gray. And um, again, doing this refinement now in, uh, in a force field that, that uh, reproduces some of the characteristics of the lipid environment in the membrane, um, we end up with the structure shown in pink, which is uh, close to the X-ray structure, which was subsequently uh, given out, which is in purple. Um, now, I should emphasize, though, this is now, I'm showing you it's in the membrane. This protein also has loops. And the loop regions we um, were, uh, our model was basically wrong in. Um, and uh, the, the problem with loops is that, again, I'm talking about this deep um, well that the native structure sits in that really applies to the core. But loops are much more, are much more shallow wells, and those present much, and sometimes they're quite flexible. They don't really have a well-defined structure. And those are much more challenging for, um, for modeling because you have to be able to compute much finer energy differences. OK, but really where the practical utility of this methodology, I think, has turned out to be um, is uh, in combination with experimental data. And as I said, when you have experimental data, it really limits the search enormously. And I'm going to illustrate now um, different ways in which this basic procedure, which I've described, it's going to be the same two-stage protocol. We start with a extended chain, you hold up uh, the low resolution level and then the high resolution level, how we can incorporate experimental data of different types. So in some cases, this is another prediction from uh, CAS, the blind structure prediction. In some cases, the predictions are actually accurate enough that you can solve the X-ray crystallographic phase problem with them. This is really the exception to the rule, so it's not really a practically um, useful method, um, unfortunately. But this just shows a case where um, this is a prediction, and then the electron density is um, is uh, sorry. This is actually the native structure in electron density that was computed using phases from a model and experimental uh, diffraction amplitudes. And you can see the map is essentially perfect and can be traced easily by auto building. Um, the problem, of course, is that molecular replacement only has a, has a pretty narrow radius of convergence, too. So you have to be really close before a model. The model has to be really good before um, one can use it in this way. Um, now, uh, Frank DeMaio, who um, was a graduate student here, has, um, has now um, He's implemented something which is actually quite a bit more useful. He's put in a term which reflects the agreement of a model with the electron density uh, into this, um, into both stages of the search process. And you sort of saw the, the first application he looked at was um, uh, to uh, uh, try electron microscopy density. And you can see the model sort of rearranging itself to try and fit into the density. Uh, and uh, uh, this has been a collaboration with Bob Chu's group. This has been, um, sorry. so uh, using um, data, this is pretty high resolution cryo EM data. This is, again, the same type of plot. So now we're applying fit to density. Um, here, here he's starting with a C alpha trace that was basically hand tracing the model to the density and then going through this Rosetta refinement process. And you can see that the model here has um, gotten quite a bit better, starting in red, uh, moving to green, and blue is. Uh, crystal structure, which was known independently here. Um, so sorry, this is a busy slide, but this is more of Frank's work, so I wanted to highlight it here. Uh, so what Frank is looking at now is um, uh, a, a, in trying to increase the base of convergence of molecular replacement. And the neatest thing is he, <coughs> if, you a, if you have a starting model, or if you have a, a series of possible models, uh, you can use of programs like Phaser to, um, to try and solve the phase problem with them. Basically, ask, is there a position of my model in the, in the unit cell where I can um, uh, recapitulate the, um, uh, the diffraction amplitudes and then get phases from that? Now, in difficult cases, cases there are not, the best solution isn't that much better or maybe worse than uh, the correct solution may, may sort of lie in the noise. And so what um, Frank has been doing is taking many possible solutions generated. These are this is the phaser score. This is basically how well phaser gets the data. This is how good the models actually are. You can see there really isn't much correlation at this stage. And then Frank takes these structures, refines them in Rosetta, and then um, you can see in this case the best, the correct solution has now achieved a much better score. So this is still early days. 
but there's an exciting possibility about being able to really speed up uh, uh, X-ray structure uh, determination using uh, using molecular replacement. That is, be able to achieve good solutions to the phase problem with molecular replacement models where you can't currently do that. Okay, but probably the um, the most um, the, the most immediately useful application of this methodology has been the NMR structure determination. So in that first movie, when the protein's folding up in that uh, in that um, very rapid way, something that's very important is is the um, hypotheses about what the local structure is in different regions. And if you just have the sequence alone, you can't be sure. So you have to model each possible chunk of the sequence with a variety of possible building blocks. But if you have NMR data, particular chemical shifts, it gives you information about the local structure. And you can use this to guide your selection of, of possible of things, possibilities that need to be sampled during that initial structure buildup phase. With that back a few years ago, we showed that using this information was alone enough to chemical shift information, which one gets at the very beginning of a NMR structure determination process, was alone enough to really uh, bolster the search enormously so one could reproducibly get very accurate models. And really all that the company NMR data was doing was defining what the space of local possibilities was in that initial search. So the NMR data go in and so that first rapid large scale search sort of homes in a little bit more easily on the native structure. And then the subsequent high resolution search is really just the same as what I showed, but you've got so much more density sampling uh, density in the region around the native structure that um, it, uh, 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 that you find it, you find it very, very much more frequently. And so, whereas, or I said that initial structure region isn't really very useful for protein to go over 100 amino acids with chemical shifts, one can become confident about um, about uh, the structure calculation process. And uh, this is now being used quite um, quite frequently. I, I I got a paper to review a year ago. This is when I knew that things were really was really starting to work. I got a paper review a year ago where someone had solved the structure. You get they downloaded was that they put in chemical shifts, they calculated the structure, and then they solved um, uh, they had crystals, they solved the phase problem with the model and they touted this as a, they described this as a new approach. And I hadn't heard about it at all, so then I knew that this had to be it, it was definitely useful. Um, and I wish that happened more often. Um, so what we've done since then is um, we've added more experimental data. If we just have the chemical shifts, we can get up to about 100 and 120 20 amino acids. But then beyond that, um, the, even the chemical shift information isn't enough to help us find the, um, uh, the native structure. And the next piece of information that turns out to be very, very powerful are residual dipolar couplings, which provide information on the orientation of secondary structure elements relative to each other. Now, this sort of information is usually used at the end of the conventional NMR structure determination, or not used at all. But it turns out this has an enormous power in guiding. We put that in, we put the residual dipolar coupling information in um, during that initial low resolution search. And every time we make a move, and you can remember it was very jumpy, we ask, do we fit the uh, residual dipolar coupling data better or worse than before? And we accept the move if, um, if the data are better fit. And that really helps convergence on the native structure. So we're able to go to larger proteins up to about 150 amino acids. And, um, uh, and so um, we think that, and what's neat about both um, chemical shift data and residual dipolar coupling data is only involves backbone atoms. So a lot of the difficulty in current NMR structure determination is getting the side chains right, assigning all the um, NOEs between the side chains. And that's difficult because the spectra are very crowded and mistakes can happen. But uh, the sorts of data we need here are um, are much less potent error. Uh, so um, this is a collaboration first with that Bax and more recently with Guy Montalioni. And many NMR groups have been have very generously provided data for us uh, to test these methods. Um, this just shows that if you have chemical shift data, one can combine it with this uh, symmetric structure of folding too. So this is a very nice way of, of getting uh, information uh, from um, uh, on homolimeric structures, which can be difficult to find standard methods. Okay, so when we go to still larger proteins, um, we need more information, and now we're throwing in um, uh, distances, backbone NOEs, just enough to roughly determine what the beta strand topology is. So these, this gives distance information between the beta strands. And um, uh, it turns out that in this case, Doing many, many independent simulations turns out to be inefficient. And uh, instead, an iterative approach where 
borderline has a population that successfully picks the best structures of the population while maintaining diversity uh, turns out to be more effective. So this just shows different iterations, taking the lowest energy structures. This is the ensemble shown here. And this is the conventionally determined structure solved in Jim Prestigar's group um, using much more information, selective um, amino acid labeling to get NOEs in the backbone. Um, so again, we think that using this type of approach where Rosetta has a lot of the information in it, we're just supplementing Rosetta with a little bit of information, or at least in this, in this case, a fair amount of information, get in the ballpark. Um, there's a lot of potential. Uh, this is um, just another case showing that even though we're putting in information only on the backbone, the side chains are um, getting predicted, getting uh, determined properly too. And of course, the side chains, the position of the side chains is completely determined by the Rosetta high resolution force field, just like it is in calculations where you have no um, experimental information at all. Okay, so I want to emphasize this, which is, sort of makes the point that this approach is different from conventional structure of determination. So in conventional, so let's see. So as I've said, the energy landscape for a MAC molecule is very bumpy. Let's consider it to be this black line here. And so the result we end up with will depend on where we start. So if we stand up over the here, we'll end up at trapped in this hole, far from the native minimum. Now what happens when we add experimental data on? We get, let's say the experimental data is is, the gen is, is not very, we don't have very much data, so it doesn't unambiguously determine the structure. So the native structure is low and is good for the experimental data, but also this wrong structure over here. And of course, this in reality would be very much uh, larger with many more dimensions. So if we, add the, if we put in the experimental, bias term, experimental data term as a bias when we're doing the calculation, uh, then this structure here uh, would now no longer end up here. It might get pushed up into this higher, um, this, this higher well here, because the, the driving force is in that direction here, by on the red, uh, the red potential to start pushing it. On the other hand, if we start here, then downhill is down into this deeper minimum. Before we didn't find it, we were stuck, but now we might actually find this deeper minimum. So if we look over in this plot, then uh, we might expect to see different effects from turning on the experimental data far from the native structure compared to close to the native structure. So far from the native structure, we're out here, that's like this scenario, um, the energy could well get worse because the native produced the experimental data is sort of at odds with the, with the energy function. However, if we're close to the native structure, like here, then putting, adding the experimental data can actually give us lower energies. Um, and this is exactly what we see. So this is a calculation. This is actually from the one that I, protein I just showed you, the uh, larger protein. The black dots, the gray dots, are what we get um, uh, from many independent calculations in the absence of experimental data. And the red dots are what we get when we turn on the experimental data. This energy doesn't include anything about the experimental data. Uh, it's just that when we turn it on, now we can access this whole region here we weren't accessing before. And so we, have, we find these very much lower energy structures. Now, um, this is not at all intuitive, because in general you think if you're doing the constrained optimization of a function, uh, that you would do worse than when you are doing free optimization, which is this great place. And in fact, when we don't get close enough, this is a still larger protein where we don't, where we fail. In this case, when we turn on the data, we don't access lower energy points. In fact, the energies move up a little bit. So this um, finding of this, this result where one gets lower energies in the presence of experimental data um, is uh, a real hallmark that one's on the right track. And so this is one way in which one can know that one has computed the right structure in the end. Um, and, uh, and one more point here is this sort of also emphasizes the difference between this approach to using data to solve structures and conventional structure determination, where you really rely solely on the data to um, give you your final model. That's really what determines the structure of the model. And you can see with data like this, you, if you just relied on the data, you might end up over here. It's really the combination of the two and the data guiding you into the right region for the sort of the physical chemistry to take over that's um, that's making this work well. This just shows that one can put in other types of data. This is just disulfides. This was a collaboration with Tim Springer and uh, with disulfide mapping that gave distance constraints to map. This is the uh, site of the transmembrane region of the integrin receptor. This is a Rosetta calculation compared with an NMR model that appeared afterwards. Okay, so in summary, 
uh, structures can be determined with Rosetta using limited experimental data. I've taken you through the different types of data that one can use. <coughs> There's, um, I think, an exciting opportunity to use solid state NMR data, um, as well as other types of data, too. And I think this is, again, a general route to structure determination from limited data. We're really interested in working with people, helping people use this, um, the methodology, uh, which we, of course, adopt freely to um, try and solve structures. So the yeah, data sets either get, get, get our program, or um, if you don't want to try it out yourself, we'd be happy to help. Um, all right, so uh, something that's come up more recently that I'm quite excited about is can we start thinking now about exciting states of proteins? And this has become interesting recently because there are methods like NMR methods that, and other methods that have come out where you can start looking not only at ground states of proteins, but the activated states where, which may play a different various roles in protein function. <coughs> so we, um, we came at this, or we, we came on this in sort of an indirect way. We were testing to test um, the, uh, the, the force field that we use. We just took um, a large number of proteins, I think there's 117 shown on the slide, and for each of those, we carried out a large amount of sampling using the Zed at home. Um, but we spiked in some information about the location of the native structure, so we would be pretty sure to sample close enough. I told you, for most protein domains, we simply don't sample very close to the native structure without experimental data. And so um, you can see in all of these plots, the region around the native structure is lower in energy than, um, than regions which are higher. These are the same type of plots, energy versus RMSC. And you blow up, just take one of these and blow it up, you see that, again, the lowest energy structures are very close to the native structure. If you superimpose them on the native, they look very close. However, if you look closely, you start seeing cases where, well, where, like this one here, the lowest energy structure is close to the native structure, but it's not exactly there. There's another case. So all these cases start appearing, appearing where here's, for example, low uh, structure, here's, but here's, here's something that's higher RMSE, but lower in energy. So of course, our initial reaction was to think, oh, this must be errors in our ability to compute energies. And that's still certainly to be likely to be the case for um, a number of these. But when we look closer, uh, we started to think that there might be a little bit more going on. So this is an example. Here's energy versus RMSD. <coughs> here, um, here we have some structures out of four from RMSD, which are lower in energy than the ones that are much closer in. So what's going on? Well, in this protein, the, this is the crystal structure shown in red, and um, it has this loop that sticks out. All of these structures here tuck the loop in in this way. And the native structure is uh, in blue of a different, of an independently solved crystal form. And you can see uh, that probably what's happened here is that uh, that the protein prefers to stick this in because there's no crystal packing interactions that are stabilizing this loop to be out. So to test this, we took the, this whole set of proteins and we did the same folding calculation in the context of the crystal. And when you put it in the crystal, then lo and behold, the lowest energy structure that you find is very close to the native structure it's shown here. Um, and so we think that at least some of what we're seeing here, these variations, are due to the leap of crystal packing interactions, which may be distorting the structure. Um, and this just shows that generally, we see much closer <coughs> recapitulation of crystal structures when we do the folding, the structure prediction calculations in the context of the crystal than uh, or when we do it outside the crystal. Um, and uh, this is just another example where the crystal structure was shown here. We got this structure here in green, and it turned out that there was an independent structure shown in blue. And probably this is the most interesting case, and this gets at the excited states idea. Um, here's an RNA binding protein shown binding to RNA. We don't have RNA in our top in this calculation. We're just holding up the monomer. And uh, the, um, uh, we got two families of structures, the one shown in red and the one shown in blue. Turns out one of them resembles the APO structure and one of them resembles the bound structure. So this is what we started thinking that, that these alternative structures we see, these alternative minima, might correspond to things that really exist, either the absence of crystal packing interactions, or maybe they're excited states, just slightly excited states, that um, play a role in protein function. So we're very excited now about trying to map these landscapes in more detail, actually compute free energy landscapes right around the native structure, and start combining with comparing the experimental data. All right, so at the end, um, just wanted to say, um, show you a little bit about what we found with folding the box like things to move from distributed computing to distributed thinking, where we're now trying to get the whole world to think for us. And um, I was initially pretty sure that this was gonna be very useful for education. I've gone into my kids' high school a couple times, and, and the kids really get into it, and you know, you really have to 
grapple with macromolecules and stuff. Um, but uh, more recently, I've started believing that um, these people can actually do amazing things. And um, I'm going to show you some of the problems that, uh, that they've been able to solve. And then I think I'll go through my slides and then give you a, a demo. Uh, so when you play old it, actually, you know what? Let me do it in the other order. Let's see. So uh, when you play old it, um, you, uh, you see a, bit, a, a, bit, uh, a version of the protein here. And there are things you can do. You can, you can move it around like this. And the things to pay attention to are, um, are, are my score, which is the most important innovation. We had to take the energy and multiply by minus 10 to get something which was more of a get a better, get a higher score, or stop the right range of the now this is competitive. <laughs> so, um, uh, so these are all the other people who are playing right now. And uh, this is our score here. So we're going to see if we can catch up. So there's some things we can do, which are just like, um, which are just, like I said, pulling on things. I can, I can, I can move side <laughs> things. Um, but you know, people, you, this is not really, you're not going to get very far just pulling things around. But you want to take advantage of but people can do higher level things. So I can say, I can say, well, okay, I've tweaked things around a little bit. Now I want to just um, optimize the position of the side chain. So that's called taking. And you see my score, my score has been getting got a lot better. Now um, I could also say that um, also now I might want everything to move continuously um, to, to minimize the energy. And so I can um, first I can that's just the side chain, so let's do the little ones. And um, let's see, I think I'm, I'm already better than I was in the beginning. Let's see, let's see. Uh, and now, <laughs> now, sophisticated users can do all kinds of things. Uh, uh, that's not good. I'm not a sophisticated user, I just froze the whole protein. <laughs> um, but you can, uh, uh, well, what I'm going to now show you is that that, that um, people have, there's one, there's one more thing. Uh, sorry, I, I, am, I am not a very good pull. Here we go. So you can have it, you can tell the program to just rebuild certain regions. And that was a very good region. Okay, well I'm not going to embarrass myself anymore. First we were when we started. So that's basically what pulled it. So you would think, okay, well this you get to play around and pull things and that's kind of fun. Um, but can anyone do anything interesting with this? Uh, so that's why I'm going to show you now.
now let's go on to results. Uh, this is this shows a class of problems that folded players have been really good at. Uh, this is we give we, we gave them cases where we had models that were close, but they were wrong, and in particular there were hydrophobic residues sticking out. Um, and uh, and so people are really good at this type of problem. So you can look at this thing and say, ah, there's a hydrophobic residue sticking out. There's a hole here. Uh, you can't just tell it was how to repack the side chains because you have to move the, you have to pull this down and rotate it in. In this case here as well, you get this side chain in, you have to pull the whole thing in. Um, so you have to move the backbone and then uh, and then repack the side chains. And this is again the kind of thing that a computer can't do, but a person can see the hole, see what you have to make a guess about what has to go there, and then um, and then do it. So what we have seen here are the red are the starting puzzles, blue is the actual structure, and green is the best holding solution, the highest scoring one. So you see they're really doing some pretty impressive things here. Um, uh, we recently started giving them um, some, uh, we've added uh, um, a sequence alignment aspect to that so they can change the alignment of the sequence to a, to a, a homologue known structure. And this is just a, this is a result from a few days ago, which I thought was really stunning. Uh, this is a, they started off with the red model, and uh, they, the best score was the green one. They had changed the alignment and would build some other things along, and uh, the, the blue is the actual structure. So people are able to solve these these um, uh, things and uh, oh yeah, and then this is an interactive game. So these um, each of these lines here shows a different team. This is time. Uh, this is energy, convert and sort energy. So lower is better. And you can see how um, you saw in that leaderboard. You can people can see how well each other are doing. So if you look, there's this blue team which comes from behind here. It crosses the purple team, and that inspired all of these other people to think that there was more to be done. And uh, you see there's this huge amount of activity here um, where everyone's racing to get ahead. Um, uh, uh, and then at the end, they find you a lot. Um, and then uh, this is the different, different team members within a given team. Um, and they're trading information, trying different things out. And uh, of course, at the end, they all start sharing things and do well. They specialize. So some people are beginning our opening. Some people do middle game. Some people do end game. What's the time scale on that? I think it's days. And uh, I showed at the beginning an email that uh, this is not, I just, I, I, then we, then we were, I just decided to email the top players to find out how they were doing it. And I would, this was the thing that I found most exciting. Um, uh, and pe people have, have developed um, um, algorithms, and you can just read this one here. Um, and uh, we've started, we, we initially, the hope was we could encode what people are doing as algorithms and do it all automatically with Rosetta. But the sophistication with what people are doing, and they really use a lot of human intelligence, a lot of, well, we try this and then we backtrack and it doesn't work, um, um, is uh, things. And then people will write, like I said, write their own little uh, recipes. And sometimes the description said, then we use the, the Quake recipe or whatever it is. I don't even know what these things are. So that's been really kind of neat. So people, you know, these people have no normal experience with macromolecules. And these people know nothing about science. None of these people are biochemists. Two of them are scientists, and they just they and I, they they just like puzzles and they like the idea of doing idea of doing something related to um, molecular biology. And they've invented this whole new way of thinking about things. And when I when I go through these, I think a lot of the things would have made total sense. I mean, I hadn't thought of them, but I can really see why they'd be good things to do. Okay, so that's it. Um, so for the structure. Uh, Determination stuff. Uh, I talked about the work of Bijou Das, Box and Raman, Oliver Lamian. Box and Oliver did the work with, with NMR. Um, Bijou and Imar did the work on multiple protein domain folding. Bijou did the work on uh, uh, RNA. Uh, Frank, again, who's a graduate student here, uh, has done all the work with electron density and molecular replacement. Um, Mike Taika did the work on alternative minima, mapping out the landscapes. And uh, Folded is the collaboration with Lauren Popovic at DW, and the work was done by uh, Ross, Seth, and Adrian. Adrian is now on the email. starting with these ab initio calculations, but the amino acid polymer takes time to be connected. And I guess I've heard of, uh, you know, very rare TRAs that come in to give it more time to let the downstream unfold. Have you 
consider things like that? Yeah, yeah well, no, um, so you're talking about this with us. Okay, no, a lot of proteins have a lot of proteins made of the C terminus, right next to the N terminus. I think the reason is, is that from the, from the biology point of view, you really don't want a protein domain to hold and completely made, because otherwise you could end up with something that's that's really not um, the correct structure at all. So I think there's a lot of the way the ribosome is set up, which really prevents holding from occurring until a protein domain is nearly completely synthesized. So I think that's why it's a reasonable model to um, take a protein and the whole uh, see the whole sequence is pulled up. This is more course what happens in vitro folded genomes. You get protein unfolded. In the empirical observation, that proteins almost always pull back to the same structure that you get in vivo. So I have two general classes of questions. So the first one is has to do with the fact that you only you only observe in most cases the funnel only very close to the negative structure. Um, and this may be can be exemplified by um, the fact that a lot of your side chains and folded that would repatch um, are aromatic. Would it be that like, a lot of the potentials, the basis of a lot of our potentials, are ones that are one pairwise, so less than a many body cooperative and cooperative interactions, and um, are lacking maybe um, some of the more specific interactions like uh, NM, that came on a new high. Yeah, so what you're saying is, I think what you're asking is, we see these very, these, these funnels which are very narrow, and maybe the real ones, in truth, are broader, and maybe if we had a better model, they would be broader. Bring down the, the low arms. Yeah, well, I think that, I think, well, I guess I'd say two things. One is that's certainly possible, and uh, it's almost certainly true to some extent. But on the other hand, this, the puzzle, the jigsaw puzzle like packing is something that, um, you know, imagine, if you take the backbone of a structure, or even take a jigsaw puzzle, and you, you start wiggling the outline, at some point you just can't fit, you know, things don't fit the same. So I think it's certainly true that the, the true, nature's true, you know, potential function probably is more funnel like. On the other hand, there is something about packing problems, jigsaw puzzle problems, where they have this property where you die in pretty close to before everything fits. So I think I'd say probably both things. And then the second thing I was going to ask is about. Sampling issue. So over and over we see that um, biology is modular based on the success of the frame based method, and yeah. elastic network. Um, so what are your maybe impressions on like, the best way to maybe partition proteins to modules that are I mean, I mean domains is how proteins do it, right? You have that's how what why we're all here, right? Because evolution figured out that you could recombine domains at a modular level and start creating all these marvelous proteins that don't really algorithms. Well, I mean, algorithms, the, the dumbest thing to do is just, like, of course, you know, everyone does, you, you just parse a double long sequence and parse it into domains, then you try and do the calculation on the domains. Yeah. 
So we, the, the cis-trans proline uh, is, is handled. Um, we just have a distribution of, uh, you know, for each segment of the proline, will be some cis and some trans possibilities. As far as um, the, uh, the uh, PKs, each dependencies, for the design work I'll be talking about tomorrow, we model that. But uh, for the level of resolution we're describing here, uh, that's not being modeled. We're, we're assuming that everything is at its, you know, the, the pH is the way expect, the, piece, the charge shape we expect for pH 7 to create the class. Uh, so that's obvious, but that obviously would become important and would limit the accuracy of these types of calculations. Um, well, I think that probably requires going to a higher level of resolution, probably also lower temperature. Yeah. So what's the limit to the functionality that can actually put sequence or one of these algorithms. I mean, are, you, are you limited to quantum mechanical um, amino acids and in their sort of non-modified states, or is this something where you can actually start to look at um, no, um, post-traditional algorithms? Right, you can put in, the, the way that Rosetta is set up is it's very modular, so we easily go from, say, protein to DNA, just to say the residues are there. We're doing a lot of design work with unnatural amino acids now, and really all you have to do is just describe what the unnatural amino acid is. Uh, so it's, and then as far as the translational applications, again, it would be it, it would be straightforward, straightforward to do. Now, how accurately you'll do in predicting the subtle effects of those is another question. But from a straight modeling point of view, it's not practical. You have a lot of you know plots of the RMSD versus the energy, and there's one conclusion you can draw from that is that RMSD is a very true measure of um, success of, of Set of you know um, yeah. structures that it, you know people tend to use the uh, precision of their submitted RMSDs as some measure of how good you know their structure might be, but wouldn't this suggest that RMSD is very crude um, and is not at all you can't have any confidence that you found a a low energy structure just because you have a low RMSD. Um, oh yeah, well so why does so yeah so that's a good point. Why do you're saying that in those plots, often there were lower MSD structures with, with very high energy. Yeah. Well, why is that? It's because you know you have a native structure like this, you know, something like this. <coughs> and now, let's just say I, these are a little bit on top of each other. These two parts here, the energy will skyrocket because it's very sensitive to atomic overlaps. And maybe you say, well, in that case, you could just get relief. But maybe something's just sort of stuck between two places, so it's not in quite the right place. So you can have very high energy as opposed to the native structure. And in fact, for a lot of the older NMR structures, they always have very, very high energies because of exactly those type of effects. Since your attractive term for the term is that many flows on there, you can analyze things on the top, right? Square. It can be different on there. It's interesting to look at the same distribution of the scoring function that instead of analyzing long distances, actually. Yeah, that's right. Very close right. Correct. And forget it doesn't go a little bit off by a lot. Yeah, so you could use the number of native contacts, for example. So there are alternative measures, and but qualitatively you get the same picture. I mean, the, the details will be different, but I think the close things are close or low, and things that are far are. Yeah. And what you do see in that type of plot is that sometimes these alternative minima actually let phi arms here, this high arms here, the long loop that swung wide, but the rest of it's really. Thanks.